Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture 13. Uh, so today's a fun lecture. We're going to, after covering so much about Chisel and Scala, we're actually spend all today doing actual design, right? In particular, are we designing a queue, which is a model we've you know, seen before. We've seen the one included in the standard library. We built a tester for it, use it to demonstrate the coupled. We're actually going to go ahead and build that queue ourselves. And the reason why we're going to do this is, number one, it's good to see design in practice. But in particular, what we're going to be focusing on, not just some small tips about designing here and there, but actually seeing what it's like to try to design a generator and also take this incremental agile development approach, right? Where we're going to uh, have this long-term goal and keep striving to make simplifications to make it reasonable for us to build something, get it working from the start, get something really small and simple working. And then we're gonna keep changing the queue design. And so we're gonna see in total six different versions of this queue uh, today. And so to keep going to different versions of the queue, realize that's, that's the way you should do design, right? Rather than having really ambitious original design and building all the pieces individually and then trying to integrate them all, try to build the whole thing really simply and then incrementally extend, revise, improve, uh, and keep track along the way, right? See what's working, what's not working, what's a, uh, a bottleneck, what's not a bottleneck, and keep attacking what's supposed to be most productive for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and fire up this notebook. Good to go. So when you're designing, of course, uh, a generator for re you want to be reused, right? The whole point of a generator is that's something people can use in different designs, different projects. And so when you're doing that, it's important to recognize, you know, what functionality people want. In particular, because you're hoping to support multiple users and multiple use cases, you're trying to find some sort of key pattern that exists across all of them, right? You know, what is the um, bit that exists in all those places, right? And when you start recognizing that key pattern, you're going to recognize all the parameters you need to support all those people, and then the generation support all those different cases. Now, that's the pie in the sky goal, but it's not easy on day one to have, you know, a generator of all these parameters and all this flexibility to support all this, right? So you want to have kind of a much more progressive design process, right? Um, really make things simple and keep taking small steps at a time. And even if you're taking small steps at a time, if you keep your step cadence reasonably quick, uh, you still get a lot of stuff done. If you're trying to take these massive steps, sometimes you can step so big you actually can't complete it. Or it takes so, so, so long. If you got on baby steps, you would have gotten there way sooner, right? And so I keep this over and over again, right? Close the loop, right? It's the logo for this course. It's, you know, closing that loop. Um, get something as simple as possible working, then augment, extend, revise. I don't just do that blindly. These are things you know, these are key features or key optimizations. And as you're doing it, you may recognize as you're implementing your design, you know what? I could build it this other way. This other way seems better to me, but in the spirit of get closing the loop soon, I'm not gonna do that function feature right now. There's some function you wanna do, but you know what? Or some optimization, I'm gonna hold off on doing that. I'll put it on a list, maybe I have a file on my computer, maybe even a notebook somewhere, but you know, future optimizations, future features, defer that feature until it's actually time to do it, right? And so, and you keep looking at things you've not implemented and then you can kind of priority sort them and see which one's gonna be the most important, most impactful, and then you go ahead and do that, right? So keep thinking about what is the simplest thing you can implement to try and get this thing running. Uh, also think about how you can test it. What is the simplest test thing can get running and start getting both the thing running and the test integrated with it. And then how can you involve the test along with the thing? And this is it, you have this list of ongoing features you you know, know about but haven't added yet, automations you know about but haven't added yet. Keep priority story those and plan everything you kind of do those in the future. Okay, so we're gonna put this you know, theory into practice today by designing a queue, right? So this is, we're gonna try to make this queue very, very similar to the behavior externally of the uh, Chisel standard library queue. Normally, as always in this course, you should use standard library components when it matches your needs. But for the sake of learning, we're going to implement it on our own today. <laughs> uh, so what is the queue, right? It's a FIFO, so you know, things come in, things come out in the same order. Both interfaces use decoupled. Uh, we want to have a parameter for how many entries are in the queue, as well as the data type. And we want this to have no reasonable performance, right? We don't want to build a queue that's, you know, going to take tons of area or be really slow. Um, so how can we get started on this you know, task? It seems kind of simple, but actually start writing Verilog, or in this case, Chisel, you'll very quickly find there's actually quite a bit to figure out. And so we're gonna try and figure out what is the simplest, simplest thing we can do and try and make it, you know, fewer parameters, fewer possibilities for those parameters. And for performance, you know what? Actually, we'll tolerate a less efficient, less optimized design at first, 
And then as we start get going, we'll go ahead and start optimizing it, right? So we won't optimize on day one, but we'll get there. Okay, so for our queue, it's super simple. Let's just do a single entry, right? It's a single flop, right? <laughs> uh, and even though it's a single entry, there's still some complexity here, right? We still have to do the handshaking, you know, for ready valid signaling. Um, but even just getting a single entry right, uh, it makes it a lot simpler, right? It's only one entry to worry about, you know, or arbitrary number of things. No, the parameter for number of queues entry is going to be, you know, hardwired to one. Uh, if you remember from our discussion of the queue from the Chisel Center library, there was, you know, these pipe and flow parameters. Pipe being if you can, you know, enqueue into a full queue if it's also being dequeued at the same time. Uh, in this case, yeah, we'll support that. The flow parameter, we're not going to support it at all today at any point. This pipe parameter, some of future designs we actually might temporarily not enable that to make things simpler, but flow, which is you know, the ability to bypass the entire queue if it's empty combinationally, we're not going to do it today. But okay, within the queue, right, you know, the outside you see, you know, the couple interfaces for NQ, the couple interfaces for DQ, right, they send in bits, and when, you know, ready and valid are both true, it fires going in. Same, you know, for DQing, right, if ready and valid are both true, it fires. And so, already just to get started, we kind of can see our simple data path, right? We have, you know, some register for the actual bits, perhaps a register to kind of track the internal state of what's going on. And then we're gonna need to figure out some sort of logic to go in these two, you know, question mark bubbles, right? So let's go ahead and try and write that up, right? So um, for today, because we keep writing the versions of the same queue, I decided to sneak ahead and use some material from uh, next uh, Friday's lecture of inheritance. So uh, all today's queue modules will be technically using inheritance, but we'll cover that in the next lecture. But for today, it's, it's not gonna matter too much, right? The key point is that yes, they all take uh, you know, the same I.O. So we're all going to have the same I.O. today, you know, flipped, uh, you know, the couple coming in, the couple going out. Uh, they have a number of entries. They have a bit width. Uh, I made a number of entries of val because that way we can access that later on. Um, this is the syntax for inheritance, which we'll cover in more detail in, in Friday's lecture. But, you know, you can see it, right? We, we have a my queue, which takes a bit width. In this case, we're hardwiring number of entries to one. Okay, but what do we have internally, right? Well, internally we have those two registers, right? The register for the actual bits the register for the state. The bits is really easy, right? We can, you know, just attach the output to those that register, sure. And then now it's still in those boxes, right? You know, for ready, so we need, you know, given valid, we need to tell ready on the NQ side and given ready on the DQ side, we need to tell them valid, right? Okay, well, uh, on the NQ side, we are ready. If we are not full, so we're going to call this register full. So one being something inside the entry. Uh, so that, that makes sense. Okay, if we're not full, then yeah, we're able to take something. Or, that's the or is here, of course, if the output's going to fire. Right? If the output's going to fire, that means we're going to you know, empty out that one entry. That's just going to take another thing. This is that pipe equals true scenario. Okay, and then for are we able to DQ? Well, we're able to DQ if we have an entry, right? If we're full. Um, so that's pretty cool. Then in terms of, you know, um, actually managing the, the register, well, if we DQ, uh, of course, you know, when the DQ is firing, meaning that both DQ valid on our end is true, as well as the readings coming into us as an input is also true, uh, then sure, we're no longer full. Now, if we're enqueuing, uh, of course, we take the data that came in and put it inside the entry bits for the actual queue, and we also mark ourselves as full. Now, you maybe notice one thing I want to point out, that full is assigned in two places, right? Uh, and because of Chisel's last connect semantics, in a scenario where someone DQs and then enqueues in the same cycle, it'll be set to true, because this one's later in the program order. Remember, last connect semantics, it's gonna win. Um, if you wanted to, you can imagine, uh, you know, writing out the logic for full manually. It'd be something like, uh, you know, what would that be? It would be full is equal to uh, if, um, let's see, it's going to be false if, uh, it's going to be, oh, it's almost easier to use as a mux, to be honest, right? So, like, the right the logic is tricky. We can do it, though, right? You know, if it's full and, uh, we are firing and, uh, we, yeah, so, 
if the, if the IO and Q fires were going to be true, and we're only going to be false if um, uh, we're not dequeuing, right? We got we got to save the value, right? Um, yeah, you, you can see it can be tricky, but anyways. Honestly, using lens and dot fire made this more clear, right? Like you see me kind of struggling as a veteran logic designer, right? Logic formula out for Boolean equation. You can do it that way. But yeah, no, embrace the code when you can. We can go ahead and run it. Uh, we'll, we'll do simulation in just a second, but I'll pause for questions so far. So yeah, I'll point out, like I said, this seems like, you know, a super simple queue, right? We only have one entry. Like I said, even just handling all this a couple signaling, here I am spending a little bit of time thinking, hmm, uh, is that right? You know, you see it's not totally obvious, right? But this is about as simple as we can go, right? Technically we could have gone simpler and not even had decoupled, but uh, by, by doing decoupled and matching the expected interface, we can reuse the same testing harness for all of this. Let's go ahead and look at the testing stuff. This is the um, Q model from lecture nine. Uh, there is some small tweaks to it. Uh, which I don't want to talk about unless someone has a question. But, uh, and then of course we have the um, uh, harness, which this is also very similar to the one from lecture nine. It's not quite the same, but it's very, very close. But yeah, this is going to basically plug in that Q model to the, to the um, design instance and then try and connect them. Because we are able to use this inheritance, I, I get to reuse this code for all the different versions you can see in the next uh, lecture. Um, let's actually run it on something real. Uh, yeah, so here we can go ahead and instantiate our queue uh, and then try some stuff, right? So the printing is going to be the contents of the queue. This is the queue model, I should say. So yeah, originally it's empty. You know, we aren't enqueuing or dequeuing. Then we try enqueuing one. One gets in there. Cool. Uh, and then we try to enqueue two, but we're not dequeuing. There's only one entry, so that one entry inside the queue stays there, right? Then we try enqueuing a three, but we also allow it to dequeue. Okay, that one gets popped off, the three goes in, and of course we can uh, stop in queuing and dequeuing and eventually drain the queue. So, you know, to first glance, this looks like it works. Uh, some of you may be saying, well, this seems pretty hand wavy. How do we really make sure our queue is correct? Uh, we can do more rigorous testing, but also in a few weeks, we'll have a formal lecture and we'll come back to the queue. Uh, questions? Okay, so, you know, the some simple demonstration. Yeah, maybe test is a strong word for this. Maybe we call it a demo of the thing running. But yeah, it seemed to work. So how do we do? Okay, first off, it seems to do queuing things, right? Things come in in order. Things leave in order. Uh, technically, we have a parameterized data width, but it has to be a uint. Um, what's the problem? It only has one entry, right? We wanted to parameterize number of entries, right? So, uh, okay, that was V0. Let's go ahead and for V1, try to fix that issue, right? So how do we get multiple entries? First attempt at this is, okay, if you want to have a deeper FIFO, why don't we make this like a ship register, right? So we have multiple entries. We know enough Chisel and Scala how to, you know, spin up an arbitrarily deep ship register. We'll have some registers for the actual entries. We'll have some entries and kind of track if things are full, so we know if there's actually valid data here, if it's just, you know, an empty stuff floating down the pipeline. There's going to be some logic I have to figure out to kind of control the shifting. And some of us logic also kind of talk the ready valid signaling. Okay, so let's try to write this up. So, uh, you know, we have our entries. We're using a seek in this case because, yeah, we don't need to inject this in hardware. So we might use a Scala collection. We have the full bits. Okay. Uh, the operation to shift down. When do we shift down? Well, if we're dequeuing or, interestingly, if the entry at the end of the ship register uh, is empty, right? And the reason why is, um, I just better go back to the picture. Uh, if you look at the, the, the picture, right? Um, in general, we're going to try to uh, be smart about things, but uh, because there's, you know, only coming in one end and only going out the other end, if there's ever a gap and when you send things, you're going to be, you know, pushing bubbles down the pipeline, which is okay. You'll know they're bubbles, and so you won't tell someone else they're valid, but they'll be bubbles. Yes. It, it is a FIFO. 
it's just, it's, you know, a fixed latency FIFO, right? Whereas normally what you're thinking about the FIFO is adaptive where depending on how full the FIFO is, that adjusts the latency. That'll be a future version. But in the spirit of anything simple, we have this, you know, very, you know, blind, simple FIFO, which um, if you have, you know, a N entry FIFO, it takes at least an entry for an element to get all the way through it, right? Assuming you're always popping. Maybe you're not always popping, which case takes even longer. But it's going to take, you know, it has to go through every single flop along the way. So as a result, there may be some bubbles in this pipeline. Yes. Yes, I, I use the term popping to suggest uh, when not just you're reading from the queue, but you are, you know, doing a ready valid fire on the DQ side so that actually triggers the queue to actually pop the element off. Correct. Yes, I do say that Q word, a uh, pop word. Yes, another question? Yeah, so, 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 so they're, they're going to go down the pipeline, but hopefully we're going to kind of squish it out. So you can imagine, let's say, for example, you are, uh, end queuing every other cycle. Uh, what's going to happen is you're going to have an element going down here, followed by a bubble, followed by an element. It's going to keep going down. And uh, it's going to go down whenever this side is dequeued or if there's a bubble here. If there's a valid element here, this side is going to say they're full. So let's say hypothetically there's a valid element here. You aren't dequeuing. And like half these entries are bubbles and like half are valid data, but you want NQ and you said it's full. Yeah, you lost half your capacity to bubbles. So bubbles are not good, but they're a performance pathology we're taking as an intermediate design point. This isn't our final design, right? We're just trying to make incremental progress to get, you know, more sophisticated things, right? We start off with single entry queue. And even though queues are a well-studied topic for sake of today, acting like we're designing a queue from scratch, how can we go about designing this problem? Well, we tried a single entry queue. We now have a multi-entry queue. And this is the simplest multi-entry queue we can imagine, which is this, you know, fixed latency shift register, which um, is going to have some issues, right? We talked about bubbles, uh, but we'll fix those in a minute. But even still, getting this to work right, it's still some tricks, right? Okay, so uh, if we're either dequeuing or the last entry is um, uh, valid, so I wrote this comment here, so I don't ever forget. Uh, so within the seek, we're going to NQ into the highest indexed entry and DQ from the lowest indexed entry, right? So um, notice the shorthands in Scala of last and head. So in other words, um, if the place you DQ from uh, is not valid, right? Then of course we can, you know, ignore that. Um, when are we ready to NQ? Well, if the last entry, the one where we NQ is available, sure. Or for shifting down, right? That's also sufficient. There's going to be room there. Um, and then, of course, is the DQ valid? Well, DQ is going to be valid um, if there's actually a, a bit there. And, of course, the entries are actually passing out, for course, at the end of the queue. When it comes to shifting down, here I chose to use a for loop, right? So for uh, n minus one of the entries, you connect it to the you know, one above it to kind of do that shift down. And then the last one, we're shifting in an empty spot. And then if someone happens to be in queuing, remember once again, taking advantage of the last connect semantics, the NQ, you know, takes presence over to DQ. If the NQ actually fires, then of course we write in the new data and we write in um, the full bits that last is true. So that could overwrite this case if we do simultaneous NQ and DQ. Whew. Okay. Questions so far. Okay, so I'm, I'm intrigued. So talk me through this. What, what would you like to do? Oh, so you're saying wh wh why have both entries and full bits of separate data structures? Why not have like a seek of, of bundles? Yeah, great question. Uh, totally reasonable design choice. Yeah, you definitely could uh, pair up the entry with their full bit uh and have those um so right so in that case like in the shift down portion you have only one line because it would be connecting bundles um yeah that's totally doable you totally could have a bundle that pairs the entries with the bits yeah that can be done and i said bundles aren't required to fry out you can use bundles anywhere you want to group things together so that can be, that'll totally be a way you could you know group together those bundles sure sounds great uh, other questions or comments
Yeah. So good, good question is, um, how would you, uh, uh, take advantage of that? So with regards to this for loop, even with the bundle, I would probably still do the for loop down here. I showed how to use the functional program we talked about before. Um, the reason why it's not the main way, as you can see in this comment, it's not quite right. <laughs> uh, this portion is right. Uh, where it gets tricky um, is the corner cases of uh, shift down in IO.NQ.Fire. There's two binary signals, so four possible combinations. Uh, this particular code on the win condition is wrong for one of those four combinations. I forgot which one it is, but one of those four does the wrong thing. But in terms of shift down, for example, um, yeah, you can see how using a fold write, we have to use fold write because of the indexing in this case. We basically just connect things to the last entry. That's doable. Here's one of the few times I've seen me do semicolon in this course because I'm having a one liner here. I'm just trying to, you know, do an operation and return something. Um, and then, uh, with regards to the fold bits, uh, notice how we're actually pulling in with the initial value for the fold from these other places, which actually kind of has the right semantics, right? So. For example, in this case, we set it to true, but actually this is only true if this is true. So we could actually pull that in to get that behavior down here. So this is an example of how the function programming fits in there. In this case, it feels a distraction. I think the prologue was more clear, but I'm just showing it to get practice and get used to doing it. Cool. Uh, other questions, comments? Let's go ahead and fire this up. Now, um, you may notice I had to reproduce the test harness here. The reason why is because uh, we have this odd we have bubbles in our queue. Uh, the queue model won't behave exactly the same way. The queue model doesn't model the bubbles, right? The queue model only models the freaking queue, right? And so as a result, I tweaked when certain things are checked. Uh, I only did that for this one V1 design. For all the other designs today, they're gonna use the same harness as V0, it's a small detail. But in terms of this particular design, yeah, we can go ahead and NQ things, right? We go ahead and NQ one and two, they go in just fine, we can DQ. Uh, it works, it's gonna have bubbles, but you know, baby steps, right? We went from a one entry queue to a multi-entry queue. Like I said, keep finding small next steps to take, take that small next step, and then when once it works, assess, and then choose the next small step to take. Cool. Oops. Okay, so let's, let's assess this V1 queue. Uh, so what do we, what do we succeed at? Um, we have the queuing behavior, uh, and we have a parameterized number of entries. That's the thing this particular V1 added. Uh, what do we not like? Well, we keep talking about this issue with bubbles, right? So we have bubbles. Uh, they steal capacity from us. Um, it might even be buggy. If you use that functional programming one, it might be. I think right now, it might not be buggy anymore. Uh, part of why I had that note put there is because the verification lecture you'll see in a few weeks, um, found some bugs in this particular <laughs> queue. Um, and the Q QV1 was not rigorously tested because of course this was, you know, intermediate design point, but it shows, you know, it, you, it's good to keep testing, you'll find some issues, right? But the other big issue, of course, with this queue is because it's a, you know, true shift register, if it's a deep queue, let's say, you know, a 10 or 20 entry queue, every element has to go through all the way through there, even if it's like basically empty, still 10 or 20 seconds to get through the whole thing, right? And so that's going to be, I have you notice know, long latency even the queue is empty. That's not a, not a good feature. Let's go ahead and try and fix that latency issue and this bubble issue. So to fix that, we're going to use a priority encoder, which guess what we covered last week, right? We noticed. So by using a priority encoder, what we're going to try and do is we're going to find the first free slot in the queue. So, you know, if the queue is empty, we might as well insert the data as close as we can to the DQ spot. So that way, you know, it's ready to go. And if this one's full, okay, we'll fill in the next slot as close as we can to that. So once again, kind of take advantage of that. Um, so that's what we're using this priority encoder for is help us find the first three slots. So the priority encoder is gonna be looking at, you know, these, these full bits, see which entries are available. And then based on that, we're gonna know uh, which entry we're filling up. And then base entry, the priority encoder selects, we're both gonna put the, end, uh, when we need and put the thing inside that entry it selects as well as the corresponding um, full bit. Okay, let's try this out. So uh, we have our entries like before. Uh, now notice in this case, on the prior slide, we were using a seek, right? Because we saw in a collection of registers, we didn't care to index them dynamically in hardware. In this case, it is a VEC. And the reason why is we are very much 
dynamically indexing in hardware, right? This is, you know, a VEC in this case, or even a VEC in that, because we want to have these all set to zero when it first starts up. The reason why is, you know, you can see down here, when we actually use this stuff. We are using indexes in the actual generated hardware. It's not just indexes in the chisel uh, Scala generation. Um, and this is some stuff to kind of check out. Uh, here we have, so these bits are in stage, these bits and registers, is one if it's full. Sometimes conceptually, empty is more clear. So guess what? To negate those things, here's a little functional programming, right? Why not? Map a negation on all of them. Really easy, now we have empty bits, right? Cool. So for example, hey, if uh, we want to see if we are ready, well, we say, hey, do we have any empties? So we simply check the empty bits and reduce and say, is anything empty, right? Cool. Uh, that works. Um, then uh, we have, you know, the, um, the valid, of course. Do we have any last entries where we check? You know, we intentionally we're probably sorting down to the heads, the heads where we're going to be dequeuing from. Okay, so is there anything there? And of course, when we do dequeue, it comes from that spot. Um, if we're dequeuing, uh, of course, we're going to mark that entry as empty and then do the shift. Uh, and then when we're enqueuing, we're going to use a priority encoder based on the empty bits. And, you know, we're going to get this current free index. And then um, here's a bug fix con contributed by our verification speaker. We're basically, uh, interestingly, it's going to tell you an index to write into. But if you are simultaneously dequeuing, it's going to, that entry is going to move down, right? <laughs> And that's why there's this minus one uh, complexity here, which is a nice bug fix they found for us. Um, and yeah, whatever the entries we're going to be writing to, then of course we enqueue the bits and we do true. So you can imagine where you're writing to is because the whole thing's shifting down. If you're dequeuing, you need to you know move one lower to catch up to that bubble. Um, but yeah, so this 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 works. Cool questions. Out of curiosity, I don't know if I've tried this before. Can I do the um, exists on this? <laughs> I don't even know what I would check for. I guess I could just say exists. Oh, it's the wrong or operation. That's why you can't do that. Never mind. Got a little too crazy there. Wrong or operation. Scala or versus chisel or. So it's not going to do the right thing. Um, it may not do the right thing in that case, but yeah. You probably could actually do maybe some counting on or for one bits being like addition, but the reduction is I think plenty clear, right? Um, cool. So I said this is a pretty interesting design. Uh, so here we are using that test harness infrastructure, so it's much more concise. Although uh, one small change, I should make this num entry, so that way it's always consistent. Um, that's not too bad. Okay, so yeah, here we are, you know, enqueuing um, to prove the latency knows how it goes in one cycle, comes out in the next cycle, right? For QV1, it would not be that fast, right? I can make this 10 entries, right? And it still takes one cycle to get through the queue because it's inserting to the first free spot. So that's pretty cool, right? I could, you know, even uh, not DQ and then, you know, just for fun. Um, then put something else in there and then do a couple of DQs. And yeah, it's going to, you know, do what you expect, right? Because it's inserting the first free spot. We don't have that latency penalty. We squash the bubbles. At this point, looking a lot better. This looks like a queue kind of like we recognize. Um, so are we done? What, what, what's, what, what's missing? What do people think? And what, what are some shortcomings in this design? What happens when it's full? This particular design will not let me do that pipe thing, where if it's full and you're simultaneously enqueuing, dequeuing, this will not allow that. If it's full, it says it's full even if you're dequeuing. It won't do that thing correctly. Other, other thoughts? Um, well, let's look at what I have, right? So what have we done? It's a queue. Parameterized data with number of entries. Uh, we squall solve that bubble latency problem. 
latency is based on occupancy, right? If you have a really deep queue, then yes, latency gets to the queue is going to take you a long time with a lot of entries in there. But if the queue is mostly empty, then latency can be very short. So where, what's wrong with this queue? Mostly physical stuff, right? Uh, which we haven't talked about a whole lot in this course. As was mentioned a second ago, yeah, you can't do simultaneous NQ, DQ to a full queue.pipe parameter. But actually from a circuit level, this is not a friendly design for hardware, right? Because it's a ship register, and let's say you have like 100 entries, right? You can build 100 registers, sure. But you imagine that means that the queue starts getting full, you have data flowing through all these registers, right? It's a lot of flops, a lot of bits toggling, it's gonna burn up a lot of juice. Um, I'll turn, additionally, remember those uh, priority encoders we talked about earlier? Uh, those things can get a long logic if we're not careful, right? So five entries, no problem, right? 100 entries? That logic depth for that priority encoder might become a critical pass. Yes, a couple of hands. Yes. Yeah, so you're going to see some evolutions, and we're going to address that critical path. And towards the end of today, we are going to use counters. Good point. Yes. It's only, this is only one subtractor, right? This isn't too bad. Because we were, yeah, there's only one subtractor. So that, I mean, you're right. That, that's some gates, but we will tolerate that. It, yeah, well, usually when I have indenting, it's because I have four loops. In this case, the indenting is because it's the when loop. That's why. It's not a loop. It's a, just the when statement. Yeah. What do you mean by metadata? So you worried that like this will be a not stable circuit? So, oh, so if you basically are you trying to say that you're worried you don't have like a strong one or a strong zero? Yeah. Uh, you know, as a front end designer writing RTL, not my problem. <laughs> uh, but for the back end tools, uh, you know, hopefully they can do that analysis for you, right? Hopefully, you know, it's a C where you know in modern era we use CMOS. CMOS, you know, you're connected either to the source or ground. There should be some drive strength there. Um, so hopefully, yeah, there's a strong enough one or a strong enough zero. And if it's not strong enough, the CAD tools should recognize it and say, you know what? Uh, they're going to tell you in the timing, you need to give us a longer clock period because, you know, it takes more time for that to reach the right value. Correct. Yeah, like I said, for me, I was mostly worried about just, you know, what, what comes up architecturally? Architecturally, what comes up is, Number one, that we can't simultaneously NQ and DQ to a full queue, right? So if the queue gets all the way full, we have to empty one entry before we can use that again. So that last entry is kind of like a pseudo entry, right? You can use it, but you can't like always use it, right? It's kind of this weird thing. Um, power, like I said, lots of bits toggling, right? This is, you know, not great for juice, uh, for power. And then, yeah, as I said, if you want to go really deep, this priority encoder will definitely come a critical path, right? If you want to have a 200 entry queue with this, a 200 entry and priority encoder will definitely make a lot of clock periods I'm happy. Let's go ahead and try and fix that. Uh, so how could we do that? Well, instead of having a ship register, we'll keep the data in place, right? Same kind of thing we covered in the architecture course about, uh, you know, instead of having, you know, lots of uh, data in ROB, instead we have a unified physical register file to keep data in place, same idea, right? Uh, so we a circular buffer, and that point is that data is only written to one location. And even though the FIFO is NQing and DQing, that data is going to stay where it is until it's dequeued. So it's only written once and only read once. No shuffling around, right? A lot less bits toggling, a lot less juice. So how does this work? Uh, using something called a circular buffer. This is a technique you know, pervasive across computing, not just using hardware, but also systems. So you have a fixed sized array, in this case, and two pointers, right? And you have an in pointer and out pointer. So to insert, you simply write to the end pointer and then move the end pointer over one. And then for dequeuing, you simply read the value from the out pointer, and then you move the out pointer over one. And the reason why we call a circular buffer is, of course, when these pointers reach the end, you wrap back around. Now, uh, this all makes sense, right? So you can insert data in and increment in, pop data from out, increment out. So it's kind of trailing that. So you kind of see, you know, just move around the, the queue together, wrap around to get to the end. Um, how do you know if you're empty or full? Uh, well, 
Uh, good question, right? Because <laughs> if the two pointers are the same location, does that mean you're a full queue or an empty queue, right? If they're different locations, you know you're neither for, full nor empty, and you're not, we're not working too much, right? That means you have room to take more things. You also have entries in there to actually pop. So if, if, if they're not equal, that's fine. But if they are equal, you're like, oh shoot, does that mean I'm full or I'm empty? Like there's, <laughs> there's nothing in between. Um, so for today, what we're gonna do, make things simple, get something working. We'll go back to this in 10 minutes. We're gonna say, hey, if the pointers are equal, that means you're empty. And when you're full is when n plus one, you know, wrapped around potentially, equals out. So does that mean we use every entry? No, that means we're sacrificing one entry to know if we're empty or full. So we're never actually gonna use all n entries. We're only gonna use at most n minus one entries. We'll solve that issue later, like I said. Make compromises to get things working, right? Don't try and solve the hardest problem on day one. Make those compromises. In this case, we're taking a big leap to go to circular buffer. We'll sacrifice an entry to get this thing working. And then later on, we can worry about getting an entry back, right? So let's go ahead and even try and get this thing working. Uh, so how might we do that? Well, to make things simpler, once again, we're going to also <laughs> say we want to power two number of entries. The reason why I'm requiring that is because uh, that way, we can count on the wraparound behavior for the, for the counters. Uh, right now we're doing counters the hard way. We're actually declaring registers and then, you know, adding one and making sure you're using the wrapping addition. Uh, we have our entries. So notice how now our design is just a bunch of registers and these, you know, de facto counters, even though we're not actually using the counter functionality yet. Um, and so for empty, we said, yeah, if the two counters are equal, that means we're, you know, empty. If, the NQ index plus one wrapped around because the power of two, there's no mod symbol uh, equals the DQ spot that we know we're full. So you can kind of see how this plays out, right? You know, we can take something if we're not full, we can DQ something if we're not empty. Uh, the bits comes from wherever DQ index is. And then, uh, you know, well, when do we DQ? Well, if we do DQ.fire, of course we, the bits are already connected. It's really just a matter of moving over DQ index by one. And then the, um, uh, NQing, same thing, right? We put into that spot where the NQ pointer points, and then we increment the NQ index. So, yeah, it's an interesting design, right? The last couple of Q designs we had, we had these full bits and priority encoder in the last one. No more full bits, right? Now it's just these two indices we keep moving around, uh, etc. If you want to go ahead and actually fire this thing up, uh, it works, right? So here we do a more complicated test case. Uh, we fill things up. Get the right behavior, make sure the model knows it only has n minus one entries. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, it does all that. Uh, cool. So this works. Uh, I think the shortcomings you kind of can see coming, right? Uh, so what have we done? Well, we have a queue. Parameters number of data and number of entries. Latency is, you know, base occupancy, which we want. Uh, because we're using this in-place architecture, less bits toggling, much shallower logic. Remember before we were about that priority encoder depth scaling up? In this case, the only thing we're worried about is, you know, the muxes to get into and out of that, you know, reg of VEC, right? Um, which is going to be much shallower. It's going to be growing log n rather than n, right? So it's going to be a much uh, shallower logic that should be totally fine in many cases. Um, so what, what's wrong? Well, what's wrong is number one, the thing we talked about where our capacity, number one, we lose an entry detecting if it's full or not. And number two, we require it to be power two. So that's also, uh, you know, a constraint. It's not super flexible. But like I said, incremental design. Place constraints, right? Make simplifications, right? If we try to handle arbitrary number of entries on day one, maybe it's more complicated. Make the simplification. In this case, constrain ourselves to a power number of entries. Put that not just as a constraint in the code, but actually make it explicit. So that way, if someone tries it the wrong way, it'll break. It's okay for your design generator to say, you know what? That parameter combination you're asking for, I can't do. That's much better than you giving people wrong code, right? So make some implications, get things working. Um, and so that's the simplification we made. Another simplification we made is this one, if it's full, it doesn't, they can't do the pipe behavior of, you know, NQing, DQing to a full queue. Cool. Questions so far? Yes. Oh, great. So uh, in the prior slide, um, I said mem question mark. Yeah, uh, mem works just fine there. Uh, and I find uh, if you have a reg of vec, 
it's conceptually pleasing, but honestly, just use a mem. The, uh, the, we've seen the Verilog. The Verilog is going to use an array as opposed to the regex that have a bunch of elements. The mem is going to make it a little bit tidier. Time behavior, regex, and mem are the same. So yeah, uh, if it's a significant number of entries, I would use a mem. Even though it's called mem, it does not necessarily mean it's sram. It does not mean it's dram. It just means that. And so by default in chisel write, mem is combinational read, synchronous write, which is the same as a register. Uh, if you want, you know, a synchronous read, it's a sync read mem, which is also available. Yeah. Okay, so so I was saying that using a mem in this case is a pretty good idea. Um, but the sync read mem is going to change semantics, right? Because now you have to, like, spend time reading it. Uh, you would imagine such a leap would be mandated if you had a really big queue and you have so many entries you want to implement it with SRAM, right? If you want to implement it with SRAM or maybe perhaps VRAM and FPGA, then sure. Uh, at that point, you probably should have a sync read mem. Um, but right now, we're using registers. Mem is probably good. Cool. Okay. So yeah, let's keep keep improving, right? <laughs> That's the name of the game. Um, so let's get that last entry back, right? Uh, so we said it were a circular buffer. We had a hard time with these two indices to know when the two indices are equal, is it full or is it empty? Uh, well, guess what? If your entries are, you know, say 100 bits or something, losing a whole entry is pretty wasteful, right? So what if we spent just one more bit to get the entry back, right? So we're going to add this extra bit of state called maybe full. And it captures this corner case, right? So basically, we only check maybe full when the C's are not equal, right? Sorry, when, excuse me. When indices are equal. When indices are equal, then we check maybe full. Uh, so for example, um, if indices equal and maybe full is true, then that means it's full. If the indices are equal and maybe full is false, then it's empty. And if the indices are not equal, well, we know we are neither full, full nor empty, so we both have room and can DQ. OK, so let's go ahead and code that up, right? So we still have the same constraints as before. You know, it's power two, but um, we also now have this register for maybe full. So you can see it kind of modifies this case for empty and full, right? If the indices are equal and it's either not maybe full, that means it's empty. If it is maybe full, that means it's full. Uh, and of course, if I'm ready, well, that means I'm not full and valid. Sure, like before, it's our stuff the same. We have the same wraparounds. Just now we need to also handle the special case of maybe full, where, you know, okay, if indices are the same, we have to kind of change maybe full. Um, Maybe full isn't super trivial logic, right? It took a little bit of thinking to get that right. Um, but yeah, th this is going to work. Uh, so go ahead and move on to testing it. Sure, we can go ahead and fill it up and drain it. Notice how now we had four entries, and we actually can use all four entries before we had allocated four, only could use three. So that was a shortcoming. Um, so cool. Uh, so what have we done? We have a queue. Can actually use all of our entries. That's cool. Right latency, less bit shifting. So what are our constraints remaining? This is getting shorter and shorter, right? We've had this incremental design process, and we had this long list of constraints, long list of simplifications. And step by step, we've kind of incrementally removed them all, right? And this is kind of the way you should go about it, especially on your projects. So yeah, we still have a constraint passing through power two. And we also can't simultaneously NQ and DQ. But those are both solvable problems, right? So go ahead and solve those, right? So for Simultaneous NQ, DQ, uh, it's simply a matter of adjusting when we're ready, right? And so in order to make it okay, well, it's either if we're not full, but if we are full, or uh, if we're DQing, right? So that's actually going to give the right behavior. However, uh, this is not a you know free lunch, right? In this case, as it says right here, there is now a path where our DQ.ready feeds into our nq.ready. So that in itself is not a combinational loop, but because there is that path between the two, uh, that could either be a combination, that could either be a critical path, or depending on how the rest of the circuitry is set up, that actually could be a combinational loop. So that connectivity is not obvious from the outside. Um, this is part of why in the original chisel queue, they have this pipe parameter as an option, right? It's not always there for this exact reason. There are situations where having these two things connected um, 
can either be a critical path or a combination of loop, in which case, having that be toggleable is desirable. So right now, I have not made it toggleable, I just made it there, but in a second, we're gonna make it toggleable. The rest of the design is the same. Uh, so okay, I have to go ahead and set that up, run it, sure. Um, like before, we can you know, go ahead and use all the entries. Uh, cool. In this case, you see how uh, we are pushing in the three while popping off the, the, the one. That works just fine, right? I go ahead and add even another one so you can kind of see that playing out. Uh, you know, put in a four. So you see, yeah, the queue gets full and is able to end queue and dequeue simultaneously just fine. So that's cool. Good job, team. Uh, so how are we doing? Okay, we got a queue. Parameter system of entries. Uh, latency based occupancy. It's efficient. We can now enqueue and dequeue in the same cycle. Um, so the, the shortcomings are getting pretty short, right? Uh, we just power to constrain on capacity. And our combinational loops are possible because of these two things being attached. If not a combinational loop, possibly a critical path. Let's go ahead and do one more set of revisions. So here we go in V6. And we're going to do a few things, right? Uh, for the number of ent for our entries, we're going to go ahead and use the mem. Uh, we're also going to use a counter for indices. And using a counter is actually really sweet because not only is a counter, you know, encapsulates complexity we want it to, uh, the chisel standard library counter has already had to figure out how to handle wraps, right? And so for non-power two, it does the checking for wrapping, does the wrap by itself. For a power two, it takes advantage of it, you know, having natural binary encodings. So that complexity, we don't need to worry about anymore. We just use a counter. And it's going to handle the wraps for us. Um, we still have our maybe full. And then, um, yeah, for example, for checking empty and full, I did, in this case, manually common civil expression elimination of basically pulling out the two indices are equal. Because we have these counters, we've got to, you know, grab the dot value out of them. Um, if they're equal and, you know, like before, maybe full or not maybe full. Now it's interesting. For this issue of NQ and DQ if the queue is full, we now have a pipe parameter. And so if true, we will connect it for you automatically. If not, we'll break that link for you, right? If you're concerned about that path, either being a critical path or combination loop, you can set the pipe parameter to false, which you know, this is a configurable thing with a default value true, but you can turn it off. Sure, we broke that path for you. do not worry about it. Um, this other stuff is actually pretty fluid, right? You know, see, for example, things like, uh, this is all the calculations for ready, for the valid and the outputs, basically it's not empty. The bits takes from the, you know, DQ counter. Um, and uh, here we notice how we use our counters. Here we simply say things like, when we're DQing, we just simply increment the DQ uh, counter. Or when we're enqueuing, we simply increment the NQ counter. So this actually is a pretty cool use of that counter API. And it starts to look more like code and less like hardware in this case, but no, it works out pretty well. Um, and then there's this one uh, bit of oddity here. This one is the one you gotta stare at for a second. Uh, okay, so if we ever have a difference in NQing or DQing, right? So in other words, are we firing? If they're both firing at the same time, uh, whatever status we have is gonna stay the same, right? If we were, uh, let's say we had one entry, and we have NQ and DQ, next cycle we're still gonna have one entry, right? So whatever our status is, perhaps we're full, uh, it's gonna stay the same, right? So uh, really the fact that this may be full variable is only gonna change when we're NQing and DQing at different cycles, right? If they're, if they're not the same. So if they're not the same, then maybe full is gonna be based on if we're NQing, right? Uh, if we're enqueuing, that means, then yeah, and, and these things are not the same, eventually could be full. Now, if there's ever a case where we become not full, as soon as we become not full, so originally, in order to get full, right, we have enqueue.fire true a lot of times when dq.fire is not true. So the first time that happens, we're going to mark maybe full to be true, right, because enqueue.fire will be true. Now, uh, like I said, eventually, if we actually get full, uh, we can stay full, and nq.fire and dq.fire will keep being true at the same time. As soon as there's a mismatch, uh, then we're gonna unset this, and then when the drains, it'll already be false. And so, yeah, so this is not the most obvious logic the first time, but it's one of these things where having those other pieces in place makes this kind of analysis much easier, right? We're taking advantage of a lot of 
abstractions here to build up our, our hardware, right? We aren't just doing ready valve singly manually. We're using these dot fires, using a counter to handle the wrapping for us. And we can do nice things like dot ink for us, which is very handy. Uh, here we have, you know, a Scala parameter uh, toggling, you know, certain hardware functionality. Uh, we wrapped up things nicely in the mem. Uh, this is no longer needed. I put it there to remind us we had this invocation. So yeah, this is pretty spiffy, pretty nice code. And actually, if you look at this code, and you go peek inside the Chisel Center library, architecture release is pretty similar they have. The, the Chisel Center library queue is going to be two counters indexing into a mem. Uh, so it's actually look pretty similar to this. Maybe not exactly the same, but, but, but similar. Cool. Questions? Comments? Okay, so uh, let's fire this one up. And then, yeah, for a demo, we can go ahead and, you know, fill it up. We can even, like we did a second ago, show it continuing. Um, we can even do an NQDQ at the same time, right? It's a queue. It's kind of fun to play with it. Um, yeah, cool. So we have a working queue. So does that mean we're all done for sure? Anything people could imagine wanting from a queue that we don't have right now? Give me a hint. Um, we've done a lot of things, right? We have a freaking queue. Parameterize a uh, number of entries, parameterize data width, latency space and occupancy, so efficiently it's that way, it's good. We have data staying in place, so it's efficient communication wise or power wise. We can in queue and dequeue the same cycle if we want to based on that pipe parameter. And we support non power two capacities, right? Those are all um, freaking awesome t uh, accomplishments. So what's missing? Well, number one, uh, we're assuming you have a UNT, right? Perhaps you don't. Perhaps you have a bundle or something you want, whatever you want. So we'll cover generics uh, in a later lecture. Um, that's a pretty small shortcoming. Cool. Other questions? So before we wrap up, I did want to acknowledge that on Monday I introduced a project, and I forgot the most important part, which is what should your generator actually do? Um, so, uh, like I said, I really want to encourage people to kind of have fun with this, right? Um, so, even though I talked a lot about the process about, you know, how do you design things efficiently, how do you, today was all about incremental design, kind of figuring out compromise, thinking some locations, and then build on top of it. Um, what should you actually build? Well, like I said, that's hoping, we hope you have your ideas, your own ideas about. That's why I tossed this project announcement out a little bit early this quarter. That way you have time to think about it and prepare and also find a partner. Um, but if you find yourself totally stumped, feel free to come by an office hours. I can try and see if I have some ideas that make sense. We can find out some interest that makes sense. Things to look for on a possible project topic. Uh, number one, something that size and complexity is doable in this time period. Um, it's also good if these projects have some ability to um, have parameters and generation, right? For example, let's say you want to go run off and build a RISC-V core, right? Which is what Chisels originally used to do. Uh, that'd be a lot of fun. There's a lot less opportunity to do parameterization here because the core is, you know, very rigid as an ISA and you, it's not a lot of generations. It's kind of very straightforward coding. And so that's part of why this course tries to be much more hardware design centric rather than process centric is that we're trying to get you to just kind of see more generation, more flexibility. Yeah, so try to find things if you can to have opportunities for parameters or flexibility or generation. Now, sometimes you do something that seems like a pretty straightforward thing, but there's still some room to like squeeze some parameters in there. For example, maybe it's like a certain operation, but you can change how much parallelism there is when you're computing that operation or something. Um, the other thing I want to suggest is it's okay to make hardware for this course, maybe not for outside this course, that is fun to build, but maybe not quite be perfectly realistic, right? And by that, I mean, consider, for example, the game of life we did uh, for last week's homework, right? Where, yeah, it was fun. We did game of life and hardware. Uh, you know, if one was to build out in real hardware, they would probably not have, you know, a really massive game of life board with each bit connected to a tester, right? <laughs> and it's not going to be super scalable. But for, since we're doing simulation only in this course, take advantage of that, right? If you want to have uh, a design that kind of needs a tester to harness it to do some interesting things, that's okay. We've had students in the past do things like a fractal generator 
or like an audio filter or something where that where they actually need the tester to kind of like harness the interface with it. So the hardware is still doing interesting port, interesting stuff in the middle, and that's what we're excited about. But for the sake of you know getting something running like this course encourages, take advantage of having a harness and you know escape out and you know jump over Scala code. That having a harness that does certain things for you. Um, what would it be? Let's say like things like a Mandelbrot filter. We have like you no know, visualization being done by the harness, or maybe you want to do Snake or something, right? Um, these are the kind of things. So, so you look at a web page for some past projects that can maybe get some inspiration. Uh, this quarter, I am turning heat up a little bit in terms of the size of the project expectations. A little bit. I've made homework a little bit more compact. Give more time for the project. We want to see a little bit bigger projects. Also, we have two-person teams, right, or one-person teams this quarter. So. Also needs to be a little bigger project. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the thing. So it should be fun. Hopefully it's something you have a personal interest in doing, you're kind of curious to go play with. But if not, come bug me in office hours. I'll see the rest of my ideas and suggest for you for projects. Cool. Other questions or comments? All right, that is all then. Okay, have a good day, folks. <laughs>